Shalom, brothers and sisters. This Thursday's thought, I want to talk to you about a very controversial and hyped up quite ridiculously by Hollywood, and that is the Antichrist. And I want to begin this conversation by first expressing that there are three types of Antichrists, and we're going to go over all three of them here. There are those that claim that there is no Christ. There are those that claim that they are the Christ. And there is Satan, Lucifer, Lilith, those that are perdition. And I'm going to go into detail as to why each one of these are an Antichrist. <clears throat> now I want to start off by explaining that the term anti, the Greek word that it comes from has two meanings. It can mean against and it can also mean in place of. So that, you know, shows really all three of those. I was going to say two, but because if it's someone who is against, then that would be Satan and perdition. And it would also be those that claim that, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, right? But in place of, those would be the they that claim to be God. They that claim to be Christ. I want to start off here with the Book of Mormon. Alma chapter 16, verse 7 in the RAV, which is the Community of Christ or RLDS edition. Chapter 30, verse 6 in the OPV, which would be the Salt Lake City Church or Brighamite edition. It came to pass in the latter end of the 17th year, they came a man into the land of Zarahemla, and he was Antichrist. For he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies, which have been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. We're going to skip ahead to verse 13, REV, verse 12, AOPV. And this Antichrist, whose name was Korahor, began to preach unto the people that there should be no Christ. So, this falls into that first camp. This, this, The book of Alma obviously takes place and is written before the coming of Christ. So this is someone who's claiming that Christ isn't going to come. Now I want to start here because time-wise it's, it's, it happens first, I guess. But also because I think it's important for us to realize, recognize, and understand that this is not only true of those that claim Christ wasn't coming. We see this again in the Book of Mormon in 3rd Nephi where they're going to put to death all these believers because Christ hasn't come yet. There are those that claim that Christ isn't coming again, that there's no second coming. And this would be the same type of Antichrist. They're teaching a message that Jesus either isn't coming or didn't come in the first place. And it doesn't matter when throughout time or history either of these things are said. They are both messages taught by Antichrist. They're teaching a message against Jesus Christ and in place of the actual theologies and doctrines of Christ. Now sticking historically with in the timeline, the next mention of the Antichrist would come from the book of Daniel. And Daniel chapter 11, it says in verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And skipping ahead a little bit to the next verse, he shall magnify himself above all. Now let's take this and go back in time again. And now let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So here we have the example of Satan as the Antichrist. What makes Satan the Antichrist? He's trying to exalt himself above God. And there is nothing above God. 
God is the highest. So now here we have two different examples. The idea of those trying to be better than God, put themselves above God, and those claiming that Christ isn't coming. Now let's move to the New Testament. Well, Jesus is alive upon the earth, Matthew 24. Starting in verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And it also says in verse 11, And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. So here again, we have the idea of those pretending to be the Messiah. There are many people that will be anointed that, you know, Moses was a Messiah to the Israelites, getting them out of Egypt. But he wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. So we need to keep in mind, as we're looking at this idea of the Antichrist, the examples that we have, we've seen all three of them now, already. Those saying that they're is no Christ coming and those claiming to be better than God and those claiming to be God themselves. Now sticking with the New Testament we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2. Now I'm going to tie 1 John chapter 2 and chapter 3 together and in chapter 2 we're going to look at verses 18 and 22. Little children it is the last time and as you have heard that the Antichrist shall come even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Skipping ahead to verse 22, actually let's go to 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you do know it. You do know the truth. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but they that deny that Jesus is the Christ? He or she is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Then skipping ahead to 1 John 4, 1 through 3, we're given a test that we as Christians can use to determine what is of Christ and what is not. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. This idea of the Antichrist has been here from the very beginning. When Lucifer tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, saying, Hey, don't trust God. I know better. I'm smarter. But he wasn't. And Adam and Eve were tricked and they were cast out. Looking at this, we have to ask ourselves then, is the, is the Hollywood idea of the Antichrist real? This idea that some demonic baby is going to be born with magical power to do horrible things? Now, I will tell you that miracles do not only follow us as Christians. Yes, miracles are a sign of the power of God, but the adversary, the Antichrist, Lucifer and his children of perdition, also use a reflection of miracles. Their own, I don't know what to call them because they're not miracles, but basically they're illusions their lies, their deceptions that appear to be miracles because we don't know any better, I guess. To trick people into thinking that they are of God. So because of that, we clearly need to look at this a little bit deeper. And Jesus has given us the clear sign of how to know if the the miracles you're seeing because remember we don't chase after miracles why not because miracles can just be illusions there to trick us 
But what can't is what's in our hearts. That's the true fruits. If someone gets bit by a poisonous snake and doesn't die, sure, that, that can be a miracle. But the true miracle is knowing that that person that got bit by the snake doesn't want to see the snake put to death, but instead loves the snake and cares for the snake and takes care of the snake. Why do I say this? Let's go back to the book of Matthew. One of my absolute favorite scriptures, period, is Matthew 5, starting in verse 43 to the end of the chapter. And I'm going to kind of read this in plain English. You've heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, and pray for those which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why do we do this? We do it because this is what makes us the children of our Father in heaven. God makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. If we love those that love us, what reward do we have? And if we salute only our brethren, our brothers and sisters in Christ, what makes us any better? What more are we doing than anyone else? Therefore, be perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, by loving our enemies. This is the important key. This is the true miracle. What's the difference between Christ and the Antichrist? The difference is love versus fear. This is important. This is the part, this is the thought I want to leave with you. The difference between these three types of Antichrist, okay, be afraid, you're being lied to, there's no Christ coming. That's the first type of Antichrist. To teach the fear that either Jesus isn't coming or didn't come. The second type, be afraid because they're claiming to be God. They're trying to put their throne higher than God. They're saying that they are God the Father, God the Son, God the Mother. We've had men, women, both pretend to be God throughout history. But they're not. They're just people. The third type is perdition. Perdition doesn't have to claim to be God but their focus is to get you to hate everyone else, to fear everyone else. Ever since I was born, I was born during the Cold War, I remember the fear of climbing under my desk during these drills that they had, just in case a nuclear missile was fired and was going to be landing near our home. And I remember I was in the third grade. The principal was coming around and they asked, does anybody have any questions? And I said, yeah, I have a question. I said, if a nuclear bomb hits this school, how is hiding under my desk going to protect me? They said, oh, well, it, it wouldn't. We would just die. So, okay, so if it's further away, out of the blast radius, then what's going to happen? They said, well, there's going to be nuclear fallout. I said, okay, so is hiding under my desk going to protect me from the ashes, the nuclear ashes falling from the sky? And they said, no, it, it really isn't. I said, well, then shouldn't the important thing to do be to shut the windows to keep the ashes out? And they said, yes. I said, okay. So the next time we had a drill, I refused to get under my desk. And they said, you have to. I said, why? If there's a missile heading right here, we're dead. Hiding under my desk is just going to be a waste of my time. And if there's nuclear fallout, the windows are closed. We can't be any safer than that. I said, this is an exercise in fear. And yes, I was a little kid saying this. I said, I, I don't want to participate in this because I don't see any relevance in it. And if you want to call my parents and have them talk to me, we can do that. And all of a sudden, all the other kids 
started kind of looking around at each other and they got up and they took their seats at their desk. And that was the last time that I remember having one of those drills. Because there is no point to them. There's no point in living in fear. If war comes, God will protect us. The very ground that we walk upon will be holy. So I will have faith over fear. I remember there was a lot of, of hoarding several years back. People were hoarding. This is before COVID, so they weren't. This is before the, the hoarding of toilet paper. They were hoarding food, guns, bullets. I believe this is in 2012, and this is the Apostle Dallin Oaks from the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And yeah, some people got really upset with him because he said, Another example that I understand to be current among some members in this part of of this church is the influence of right-wing groups who mistakenly apply prophecies about the last days to promote efforts to form paramilitary or other organizations. Such groups might undermine the authority of public officials in the event of extraordinary emergencies, or even in cases of simple disagreement with government policies. The leaders of the church, referring to the church he belongs to, have always taught that we should observe the law and we should not try to substitute our own organizations for the political and military authorities put in place by constitutional government and processes. We counsel against joining or supporting paramilitary organizations. I have sometimes taught this principle by reminding that the church has counseled the storage of food and water, not the storage of arms and ammunition. As Latter-day Saints, we're not supposed to be hoarding bullets and guns. We need to be collecting food and feeding those coming and asking for help. And those are the words of an apostle of Jesus Christ. One of the things I learned growing up in the branches is there's times when those men speak as men and there are times when they speak as apostles or prophets. Those were the words of an apostle and a prophet. And I bear testimony of that. We are to build Zion, which will be a place of peace. Let war build up around us. Let mankind war amongst themselves. When they're tired of war, they will come to Jesus Christ through us seeking the peace of Jesus Christ. Look at all the wars in the Book of Mormon. Never at any time did whichever side was righteous at that time, send out military installments. They defended. They did not attack. And the moment the, the bad guys, but it was the Lamanites and the Nephites at the time, the moment that they gave in, they said, promise us you won't come back and fight us anymore and you can go home. And they released all their captives. And they sent them on their way. Is that how we do things today? No. We live in constant fear and panic. The United States alone has military bases all over the world. We have enough weapons to blow up the world many, many times over. Why? Because we live in fear. We don't, we're not a faithful nation. We're not a Christian nation. If we were a Christian nation, we would be like those Nephites that welcomed the refugees that became, they were Lamanites that became the anti-Nephi-Lehites. We would defend and never attack. We would feed and never place blame. We would love those that claim to be our enemies because that's what Jesus Christ asks us to do. The Antichrist is anyone that tells you to fight your neighbor, not to love your neighbor. The Antichrist is anyone that tells you that they are above God. That they are the Messiah. That they are the Christ. That they are the Father, the Mother, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The moment someone tells you that, you can know 
They are an antichrist. The Antichrist are those that know the reality of Jesus Christ and reject him becoming perdition. As Christians, we have no need to fear any of these people. They can try all they want to place their thrones, their prophecies, their lies, their deceptions, their false miracles and other illusions above God. But God is the creator. God is all-powerful. God is in control of all all things and I testify to you that these people will not thwart the will of God God will still use them to ensure that his will is done let God use us as scalpels finally reaching in and doing the works of the Lord and these antichrists those that preach fear and hate instead of the love and unity of God the Lord will still use them as blunt instruments because nothing can thwart his will anyone that says that God isn't powerful enough doesn't know God that's my Thursday thought for you and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ Amen